Welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab, where your host, Dave Lindahl, dissects recent multifamily deals done by his guests. Dave will extract what went right, what went wrong, and a number of key takeaways so your next deal may be more profitable. Welcome everybody to Multifamily Deal Lab. Uh, this is the podcast where we dissect deals. So today I have Sherry and Laird with me. And Sherry and Laird, tell everybody who you are and where you're from. Okay. So, we're, so, go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. <laughs> are, you guys, wait, are, you guys, are you guys married? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. So what's going on here? We got two people, <laughs> we got people trying to talk over each other. Have you guys been to counseling? 41 years we've been married. <laughs> 41 years. Wow. That's, yep. that's, yeah. that's good. All right. So go ahead. The ladies first. Uh, we live in Cave Creek, Arizona. Wow. We uh, have two kids uh, grown and four grandchildren. Um, we have been with Ari Mentor since February of 2018 when we did a three day or a uh, sem- initial seminar. Then we did the three day boot camp. Um, not long thereafter, uh, we've been to um, the 2019 Ari Mentor um, UP and then um, went to the UP in Dallas and Phoenix, which is our wow. local area. UP is Ultimate Partnering. For those of you that aren't familiar, this year Ultimate Partnering is in San Diego. Um, and it's in uh, September 2023. Go to ultimatepartnering.com if you want to find out more. Um, all right. So, so, all right. So, you guys, Laird, you guys got into this deal. Describe the deal that we're going to talk about today. How, what so, the, it? yeah, the, the deal is uh, two properties that total 232 units. Um, they're located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, the final price on it was a little over $11 million. Um, and it was a, a, a property that uh, is in an area that we know well. That's where our first property was uh, located uh, that we call Cannon Gate. Uh, so we know the market well. We know uh, the market drivers and everything that's uh, good about the area. And yeah. this property came to us because... Hold on, hold uh, on. Before you even go there... It, so you just talked about market drivers. Why did you decide to go into Pittsburgh? Fit, uh, fit, Pittsburgh, is that right? For your first so Vicksburg. Vicksburg. Vicksburg is a is a uh, multifaceted area. Uh, it's a tertiary market. It's about forty minutes away from Jackson, uh, which is the large metropolitan area closest to it. Um, but there is um, there's oil, there's lumber, there's manufacturing, uh, there's um, transportation. Um, and and then there's the uh, EDRC, which is a component of the um, Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers, <laughs> yeah. It was going to come to me. Uh, so in general, there's a lot of different market drivers. So the, the, the uh, economic basis spread out over a large area. And another reason that we like the area is that over 7,000 people commute into Vicksburg on a daily basis to work. And so that means there's not enough housing that is there, whether it be single family or multifamily. And so it gives us an opportunity to go in, take a, a, a property and then raise the value of it so that we can have higher rents and that uh, we can pick up some of those 7,000 that are coming in every day. Awesome. So uh, Sherry, how'd you find this deal? Uh, we operate Cannon Gate and the broker was working with the seller and uh, the seller had a large portfolio in Louisiana and in Mississippi. Uh, the broker advised him to divide his portfolio into Louisiana and Mississippi. And he told the seller that he would shop the area to see if there were any owners that might be interested in purchasing the Mississippi portion. He shopped our Cannon Gate property, uh, looked at how we were operating it, gave us gave Cindy in our um, group a call and told her that he was the owner of um, some some properties and would like to know how we were getting higher rents. Um, she decided to go ahead and share with him. And ultimately, he came back to us and asked us if we would like to buy these properties. They weren't on the market. They were pocket listing. And we decided to go forward with them because the price that uh, the seller wanted was within the wheelhouse and, of our uh, underwriting. Excellent. So the seller wanted, so it was, uh, are the, there's two properties, 200 plus units. Are they contiguous? Are they next to each other? No, they're a couple miles away from each other. They're within 15 minutes of each other. And did you take them both under the same deed? 
Or did you do two separate? Uh, we deeds? did separate deeds. We did separate financing, separate deeds under each. Okay. But good. we packaged them together for syndication. All right. Uh, the two, so two separate deeds allows you to sell them individually when you want to. Yes. That's good. Um, all right. So it was on for, was it $11 million? Was that the initial asking price? Well, initially, there were three properties. We purchased all three for um, $12.45 million. Um, then uh, we separated the third one out, which is only 27 units, and we joint ventured that one. The two remaining were 100 units and 132 units, and we we uh, syndicated those two properties, and that's what we're talking about today. So, how, so you eliminated the third one? You, you we didn't eliminate it. We we did take it down, but we took it down under a joint venture. Oh, all right. So, so these two that you bought was there a particular was there a straightforward asking price for these two only? No, um, I separate when I gave you the sales price, I separated out the other one. Um, we ended up with these two at 11 million once we separated right. out the third property. So was but, there a, was, wait a minute, was there a $450,000 reduction in the amount that they were asking for the original? Yes, yes. Oh, Originally okay, he good. wanted three, 13 million for all three. And yeah. um, we negotiated with him and got to 12.75. Um, and then when we did our due diligence on the properties, we found a lot of things that were out of order, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, we negotiated a reduction. We retraded $450,000. Okay. So, Lair, there was a number of things that were wrong uh, at, the, uh, at your fiscal due diligence. Was there anything, any problems with the financial due diligence? Was that off at all? Uh, the financial due diligence wasn't, you know, that we were pretty tight on that. Okay, so then let's go back to, so you've got physical due diligence, you've got a list of things that, that, that are wrong with the property that's gonna cost you money. How do you present that to the seller? Or how did you present that to the seller to get your reduction? And number one, number two, um, while you're doing that, was there more than $450,000 worth of work on your list? So if you can answer those two questions in any sure you would like to go ahead. Actually, there was more. There was over 900,000 uh, on the list of things to do. For, but it's, for just the two properties or all three? For, for just oh. the two properties. Well, I guess I guess part of that was all three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, sorry. Um, but the, of the two properties, the, the basic thing that we looked at is that um, there were some things that were cosmetic, you know, things that, you know, probably normally should have been taken care of, but just, you know, didn't get done. That's paint and, and some, some stuff like that. Uh, but the things that really worried us were there were some major erosion issues that were there. Uh, there were some overhanging uh, trees over the, the the property or over the the buildings. Uh, and there were some on, other things. That, so so why does that concern you? Overhanging trees on the buildings. Explain that. Part of it is because it could fall, and and so it becomes one of those things that when you're dealing with the um, with the lender, they're going to come in and they're going to look at the property. They're going to look at uh, the potential risks of the property, and they're going to give you a list of things that you have to take care of immediately or within within a very short period of time. And these particular things that we were looking at were basically something that if his lender would have come in and take uh, looked at the uh, at the property, they would have said, you know, you have to fix these right now, and and they would have given him that that mandate. So uh, we felt pretty comfortable when we went forward, and we said we're not asking for the cosmetic things; we're asking for the the, the things that can physically hurt the property or cause um, injury to to an individual. Okay, there let's go back to the roof. Let's go back yep. to the roof for a second. So. Yes, the root, the, the I mean the trees. Uh, the trees could fall over and they could um, and damage the property. Number one, yep. number two, uh, the stuff from the trees gets uh, trapped underneath the shingles, or uh, worse, it goes down and it goes into the gutters. The gutters gets clogged, gets clogged. Mm -hmm. The water builds up, goes underneath the sheathing of the roof, and then it deteriorates the sheathing, and now you have a big roof problem. Yeah, so that's what you. So when you say the the trees are too close, these are the things we're looking at when the trees are too close. Plus Wow. Plus root invasion into the foundation too. Mm -hmm. So things like that. Yeah. But okay. um, so what were a couple other things, Sherry? What, what, what else? Was um, the, the biggest property, the 132 door property has two pools. They have a large pool, which is a normal size pool for adults and everything. And then they have a children's play pool and the children's play pool had been stagnant and sitting there not working for two years. 
Any water in and it? It had old, green, moldy, nasty water. You in could it. call it water, but you know, <laughs> you, if somebody was, yeah, there could have been something dead in there. We wouldn't have seen it. Um, that and then the pool, ho- the pump house was leaning about ten degrees um, because of the erosion that was happening, and uh, so the plumbing was wonky and uh, we didn't know how much work we were going to have to do the pool. We had estimates of about $25,000 to repair the pool. So we asked for, asked the seller for that in part of our uh, retrade. Uh, we also had uh, a ero- major erosion that was next to the pool and next to the uh, building that had the clubhouse and the um, rental office and the laundry. Uh, matter of fact, the sidewalk was more of a bridge than it was a sidewalk because there was undercutting in erosion around uh, and through the through that area. What was so causing we, that? Um, there was some drainage issues off of the roof. Again, the roof um, that they hadn't sealed between the sidewalk and the and the boundary of the building, and so the water was beating down and going underneath the sidewalk. And then with heavy rains, it was um, eroding the, the, the dirt and uh, pack underneath that sidewalk so that there was a, probably about a, a foot to a foot and a half gap under the sidewalk and down the side of wow. the ravine. Um, and it was creating a, a little ravine into a, a creek. So um, we knew there would be problems with that, that we would have to... Um, take into consideration that we would have to fill that, uh, put metal, put concrete, put rock down and uh, build it up and then pour new concrete for the sidewalk and the uh, surround for the pool. All right. So you've got a list of things. Was was there anything else that was like out of the ordinary? Um, There were some, some shingles missing, little roofing things, little flashing on the roof. Um, You know, not major, but then there were some sidewalks that were kind of wonky that would need to be ground or re-poured. Um, was, was that from the roots of other trees? or um, Actually, I think it was just from settling and, and age. Um, these are 1970 products, and I don't think oh. they'd ever done any, you know, any restructuring of any of the sidewalks and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So trip hazards, um, those kinds of things. Um all in all, the buildings were solid. They're brick. Yeah. Um, so the so buildings were the, fine. Built, they're built in the 1970s. Do they have uh, air conditioning on the outside and uh, the window units? Yes, they do. Well, they, they're, um, uh, they have the, the separated units with the air handler in the uh, apartment itself and then the uh, condenser on the outside. On a, pl- on a concrete? On a pad. Yeah, Please. on a oh, okay, concrete okay. pad. Yeah. Okay, good. Sometimes that age has them right in the window. The window boxes. Yeah, no. Yep. Yep. I was going to ask you how you remedied that situation we're planning to. All right, so Laird, so no. you have this list of items. Uh, you need to go back and retrade the seller. What's your strategy? What's your tactic? How do you do it? So we started off by going back with the full amount. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the, the, the approach that we uh, came up with. And then we, we talked about, you know, uh, taking out the things that were the, the cosmetic things. And he still pushed back quite a bit. And uh, Sherry got the idea of putting together a letter that, uh, you know, was very straightforward and basically said, listen, you know, if, if your lender comes in and sees this, he's going to make you repair it. You know, we can give you some options. You can, you know, either reduce the, the amount of the, or give us a, a credit at the end of the sale, you know, for a given amount, or you can go and find a local, um, a, a local repair people and you can have it repaired before the, the, the sale closes. And, you know, we gave them, you know, several different options with that. And he opted uh, that the better for him was to just give us a discount at the end of the uh, $450,000. So he gave him some options. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I spent my career in business as an escrow officer. So I've seen a lot of retrades. So oh. I wrote him a pretty um, good letter that basically hit all the points and told him, you know, we would, we would work with him on the options and that, we, he could he could do these things um, or he could give us the credit. So that was the origination of that. And I'll bet that had a matter of fact mother's touch to it. Yes, it did. This is the way it is. 
Excellent. Yep. Um, so this is an $11 million deal. You must have had to raise uh, close to $3 million or just over $3 million for this? We actually um, raised six point three because for, we're for putting these two deals for the for the deals. Yes, for the wow. two deals. Why? So um, we wrote, raised over, a little over two million for um, renovations of the units. We're going to do seventy five percent of the units. Plus, we're doing an exterior um, re redo where we've repainted, uh, we've pressure washed the buildings, we've done all the concrete work that needed for the sidewalks, we're going to be doing a new landscaping plan. Uh, we're bringing these up from a C to a B property, basically. And the property's in a B area? It is, it is. So you're, so now you're, so part of your analysis when going into this deal was the fact that now you get a C asset in a B, in a B area, which means you can do a repositioning. Um, and then you've got to determine how much you're going to put in per unit, which how much did you do per unit? Um, when we an, analyzed, when inside. we analyzed the units, the yeah. unit, um, the inside per unit ended up between 67 and $6,900 per unit. We're not doing a, a full remodel. We're doing paint. We're doing new flooring, uh, redoing the countertop. We're not replacing, but redoing the countertops. We're um, putting in new lighting fixtures. We're putting in new um, plumbing fixtures like like faucets and um, new blinds and ceiling fans, you know, and new appliances, all new appliances. All new stainless steel appliances. Did you say you were refacing the cabinets or you were just going to leave them as is? Well, the cabinets, for the most part, are in really good shape. They're solid wood. They're not laminate. So we've been basically painting them if they needed paint or leaving them alone if they were in good shape. Okay, excellent. And similarly with the bathrooms. So you, whatever you're doing in yeah. the kitchens, you're basically doing in the bathrooms as well. Yes. Um, so you brought. You just said you're going to redo the countertops and not replace them. You know, me being from Boston... When I first went down to San Antonio, my first market, and um, I saw that back then, now this is way back in the early 2000s, when they, when I saw that they had painted the countertops, I just, me, I was with my partner and, and we were just laughing. I was like, they painted the countertops. Can you believe that? Little did I know, you know, after we started looking at more and more properties is that that's what they do. You know, they re, they use a special paint, but they yeah. repaint the countertops. Since that time, um, the way that they redo countertops has been like it has the 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 vastly improved that you can't even tell. Can you explain that to everybody ex exactly what they do when they redo a countertop? So so what they're doing with this is it's in uh, I don't know if it's one part or a two part epoxy that is put on it, uh, but it creates a, a really hard finish on top. And uh, they have a pattern that they put into it that looks like a speckled granite. Uh, so it's mm. actually a nice uh, gray, has gray, black, and white in it. So it's it's a, a very nice product. It matches well with the color scheme that we have for the rest of the uh, the, the the walls and also the uh, flooring that we're putting in. So it makes it a really nice, um, unique uh, look as, as they walk into it. Very very modern looking. And it's a very hard. When it once it cures, it's very hard. It's got a nice high sheen, high gloss sheen. And it's it's a nice countertop. It's a great it's a great quality product and finish. The the way they're doing it, it just gets better and better every year. It's it's just unbelievable. Yep, yep. It saves a lot of money too. Yes. Um, okay, so you had a six million dollar raise. Um, yep. This leads to a couple of questions. The first question it being, what was your to, to the investors? What was your cash on cash return first year if you're redoing seventy five percent of the units and uh, two million in rehab? So our projected cash on cash, let me uh, just get to that on, on our uh, presentation. Apologize for the delay. No problem. Um, we're, we're looking at beginning, you know, w uh, of course, first year with all the things that we're going to do, we we're at 6%, uh, but then at year five, you know, we projected out around 14%. And you're going to hit the, was it a 6% pref or was it like, we're so going to do 6%? It's a 7% pref. It's a 7% prof. And yeah. then... Well, well, we'll we'll talk about that today or a little bit. Uh, we have both a, a A1 and an A2 uh, investor. We had several people that wanted to come in with a higher dollar value, uh, so we created an A1 that had a 10% preferred with uh, a 10% cap at the end, so 20% annualized. And then we had the the let me just uh, clarify. Let me just clarify that. So it was a it's a 10% pref 
per per year and then another 10 on the exit? Yes. Yeah, it's a 10% cap on the exit. So it's a... So it's annualized at 20? Yes. Wow, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. That's a really good deal. Then what yeah. was the uh, A2? The, the A2. A2. Okay, like, just, so, just the reason I say that is because I've seen a lot of deals where... Uh, somebody that's willing to put in like a half a million or a million or somebody that just doesn't want to uh, participate in equity will get the higher pref at 10, but they won't get anything on the back end. A 10 and 10 is like, good. Um, the, the numbers worked. Yeah. So what was the, so what was the A2? The A2, A2 was is a 7%. 7% yeah, 7% return and then a variable on the back end. And what was your uh, forecast for the back end? for the 22.5. So they annualize out of 22.5? Like pretty good too. Good. Okay. So um, how long have you owned this deal? We closed it on December 28th, 2022. Right, so you're four months on. So uh, five months on. So how so how's it going? It's going well. We've been able to renovate a number of units. Uh, we raised our rents by $150 on renewals, and the renovated units are getting $300 more um, out, out the door. Okay, so that was, that was like part two of my question on your renovation. So, first of all, you have to determine how much how you're going to renovate, you know, and um, and to the amount to the extent that you're going to renovate. Mm -hmm. So you take a, an inventory of your competition, you figure out what they got, and then you try to do just a little bit better. Um, number one, then number two, how did you know what rent you were going to be able to get and know that this deal was actually going to pencil out in the end with these renovations? Well. We've done several studies. We did a an our we had our um, property management company do the studies, and they did them for us gratis. They did CoStar, they did ALN market study. We also are in the market, and our current property that we had already owned, uh, Canongate, was we've been raising rent steadily for two years, and uh, we were close to market at that point. So we knew going in that if we could create a B property, what our market would be. Excellent. And, and it's happening. Yes, it's happening. All right. Well, that's excellent. Um, okay. So, oh, so where did the money come from? Where did you raise the $6 million? That's a pretty good size raise. <laughs> well, we had um, Vanessa Alfaro as one of our sponsors, and we had Eric Stewart as the other of our sponsors. Excellent. And Vanessa has a good pool of investors. We have some investors, uh, Laird and I, and then Cindy and Lynn, our partners, have some investors. We also brought in um, a couple of other GPs that had investors. So we pooled all of our resources and we did a 506B. So you had uh, a strategy of getting sponsors that would also bring in investors you had a strategy of bringing other general partner partners in that had an investor pool as well. Yes. And then you had your own investors. So what I want to ask you is where did you get your investors? That's what everybody wants to know. How do you get these investors? Relationships, relationships, relationships. And where do those relationships start? Where and how? Um, family, friends, um, yeah. what business family, acquaintances. What do you family and friends say? How do you bring that up when... You know, how do you bring that up to a family member or a friend about you investing in multifamily properties? What, when is the best opportunity that you found? So, so I'll talk to you about a new friend that, that, that we've got. Yeah. When Sherry and I were coming back from a uh, investor's day that we had back in uh, Vicksburg on Saturday night, um, we were walking through the airport and uh, there was a lady behind us that we just broke up or just started up a conversation. And uh, she, she said, well, you know, she asked because uh, we came in on the same flight and she had come in from Memphis and it was, it was a really bad day for her. And, and uh, she asked us where we came from. And we said, we came from Vicksburg. We were at Investors uh, Day there. And she said, Investors Day. And, and so we started to explain to her about multifamily and what we did. And she said, I'm a realtor. And she said, I'm interested in multifamily. And so we exchanged business cards at that point. And uh, we've now exchanged some emails with her and we're going to get her invited to uh, some of the local um, meetup groups that we have here. And the possibility that, that, that you know, she's going to come in and be a potential investor in the future. Talk to everybody and, and keep track of them and then follow up on them. That, that's that's a be the best way to do it. 
uh, one of our investors in the first group was an individual that I met years ago when uh, I was looking for a new job. And uh, I happened to, to meet this individual. You know, we started talking. We, you know, uh, arranged to have a couple lunches so that we could compare notes about what was happening with the, um, the, the, the markets and that. And he came in as one of the investors in our properties. And so you, you talk to people, you keep those connections with them, and uh, they can be part of your investor pool. Just throw a seed out there. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. a seed with intent, but it's not the intent of, of finding people to put money in your deals. There is the intent of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, but it's not, I got to go out there and I got to raise the money type of a thing. It's no. when the opportunity yeah. strikes. No, it, 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 starts, it starts early. Uh, one not of our everybody. last... Whoops. Sorry, to let everybody know what you're doing. Uh, one of the investors in this deal came back after the after our raise had closed and said, I want to invest more money. And I have a friend who wants to invest some money. And so, you know, it's just relationships and, and creating the environment where um, they can come to you and ask you for these things. Um, letting them know that you're open to talk about anything and everything in your deals and what investing is like and um, what they should expect. Well, how do you um, um, keep track of your investors? What contact management system are you using, if any? Um, we have um, we have a great Mailchimp system. That's it's cheap, it's free, it's easy. We also have our Invest Next um, portal that we use for communications. We put out a monthly newsletter, letting people know everybody that's investing, know what's happening on the property, how many vacancies we have, what the ongoing renovations look like, uh, if there are any um, happenings on the property like Easter, egg hunts, those kinds of things, giving them pictures of those things so that they have a, um, a feeling that they're involved in the property um, and that they know what's happening. Do you do a newsletter for every property? That you want? Yes. Do you use a, a newsletter template agency? Uh, nope. I write the newsletter for Canongate. We have other um, LPs that wanted to be involved in asset management that are writing the letters for uh, the other properties. So we have letters that go out on each and every one of our properties. By the way, that just reminded me to promote my own website, Passive Investing, which is PassiveForNow.com. If you're wondering or interested in what we're doing for deals, go to PassiveForNow.com. You can take a look. It's not a commitment to give us any money. It's just a, just a look. So go there if you want to. Um, all right. So let me see. What didn't we cover in this deal that was like, wow, we got to tell you this story type of a thing? Anything? Mm -hmm. We had an investor... Um, we had an investor day, investor tour this last weekend. Um, actually, it was Friday of last week. And so these are the existing investors. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you invite them um, all down. Right. What we've done is we invite them all down. We hire a bus. Uh, we have um, breakfast provided at one of the properties. We tour all the, all the properties. We tour a renovated unit and a classic unit at each of the properties. We walk the properties and talk about the repairs that we've done so far and what's going ongoing. Um, we go to lunch at a very at a fabulous restaurant in Vicksburg. And then in the afternoon, we tour the, the um, economic drivers in Vicksburg. We, we drive by the sites that, uh, where things are happening. There happens to be a building there called My City, which is um, a center for technology. The um, Army Corps of Engineers has a, um, a whole floor there that they operate out of, and they um, provide technology that can be patented and sold to outside sources. And so we go to places like that. We go to the Visitor Center for uh, the Mississippi River Visitor Center, which is a great photo op site. We, go, we went to uh, Cannon Gate. We saw areas where the different colleges are, are in my city so, are have oh, installations. So of we do- All of your investors, the number of investors, what percentage do you think showed up? Um, well, we have about, um, let me see, we have a total of 57 investors and 21 showed up. Wow. So that's pretty a good. good. Turn, that's a good turnout. Yeah. They must have loved it. It was and fabulous. I'm sure they're going to be referring other people to you guys. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. That, that's a very, very smart thing to do. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, I, all right. So I got a couple of questions, uh, ending, ending of the podcast questions. Number one, whose Peloton is that back there? 
is. <laughs> Who's PowerPoint? It's what? It's the Peloton. Peloton. <laughs> oh, the Peloton. Yeah, You're that's fine. at your bike. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's in my office. And, and so I typically get up at, uh, between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. And uh, uh, a couple days a week, I try and get on the Peloton and, and do at least 45 minutes. Who's your favorite instructor? Uh, Dennis Morton. Oh, yeah. I like Dennis, too. I like that girl that uh, has the bandana and plays rock and roll. She's really- uh, I don't know. There, there, there's yeah. the one. Uh, is it uh, Lisa Lovewell? Oh, I like her, too. Okay. Yeah. So, so she rides more like I ride. But she kicks my butt every time I get on the 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 bike with her. So it's it's like a, it's it's a love hate relationship. That's awesome. All right, what's the between the two of you? What is the your favorite business book or or, or favorite inspirational book that you've read or are currently reading? Um, there was actually a, a a book that I picked up uh, about a year ago. It's called How Leadership Actually Works. And uh, it was a, it was by the reason that I kind of like this is that the individual's name he wrote it is Larry Yatch, Y-A-T-C-H. And uh, he is a Navy SEAL. And he talked about how uh, the Navy SEALs uh, deal with leadership issues and the redundancy that is, that is in it. And so we have some real life experiences that he uses and, and uh, we, we heard him talk and uh, he, he's a, he's a, an inspirational individual and, and he really lets you know, you know, that the, uh, the caliber of individual that is, that is in our uh, armed forces. All of those um, books written by those Navy SEALs, they're all great. I've read just about every one of them. I haven't heard about that one, though. Yeah, he was amazing. How about you, Terry? Uh, mine is Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. Okay. It's A free by, plug. It's by Carol S. Dweck, and it's How We Can Learn to Fulfill Our Potential. And that's, that's awesome. next on my reading list, yes. Oh, great. All right, good. Well, congratulations on your deal. I'm sure there's going to be another one that's going to pop up in Fitchburg. And uh, that is the uh, way that they did their deal. We just dissected it on Multi Family Deal Lab, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another edition of Multi Family Deal Lab. If watching on YouTube, please be sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, so you don't miss the next session, and review the contact links on this page.